Okay, so maybe let's start for our uh, webinar today. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depends on where are you located. Thanks for joining today's webinar. This event will be recorded, so all audience uh, agree on the recording. My name is Fionn Falk, who is the Channel Partnership Director at Strengths. I will be the moderator for today's webinar, How to Improve the Digital Banking Experience by Using Real-Time Recommendation. Retail banks often struggle to, hand, to enhance engagement and extend long-term value to their customers. A shortage of relevant data leaves them difficult to make good recommendations and difficult to bring more potential clients to their products. So today, we invite two experts on the stage. Makila Tucci, the Chief Product Officer at Credit Lab, and Juan Alfonso, our Product Owner at Strengths, to share their knowledge and experience on how to combine behavior and transactional data with advanced machine learning algorithm in order to deliver a better digital banking experience to their customers. An interesting use case will be demonstrated throughout the presentation. There will be a Q&A section at the end, so please feel free to write down your questions at the Q&A chat box, which is on the right bottom corner on your screen. And also, I would suggest you to mute your uh, connections so to have a better audience environment. So now, I pass the timing to, uh, to Makile to start the presentation. Makile, please. Thank you very much, uh, Fionn. And um, thank you for uh, all participants to um, be with us today. Uh, my name is Michele Tucci, and uh, I will be walking you through um, what is CredoLab, what we do. Uh, we will see a uh, demo after uh, Joan also introduces strengths. We'll see a very uh, unique use case in which we are combining transactional data and behavioral data from the smartphone to enrich and delight customers with a seamless user experience. And, uh, but let me talk to you about uh, CredoLab. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, we have been in business since 2016. We, are, uh, we have a dual office in uh, Singapore and Miami. Uh, today we cover about 32 countries globally with a solution that allows to score even the unscorable. So we have digital scorecards to clients to enable them to approve more customers uh, in a very predictive and very reliable way. Uh, the key characteristic of our solution is that we do this without accessing any personal data at all. Today we have uh, collected about 60 million digital footprints and scored about 6 million people, which means that we have allowed 6 million people to be um, to be scored in a fair way without bias and uh, to be included in uh, mainstream financial services. As a company, we cover nine industries from retail banking to consumer finance to buy now, pay later, digital lending, and basically uh, insurance companies and any industry at the intersection with uh, financial services. Next, please. As I mentioned, our presence is truly global. Uh, we started in 2016 in Singapore, and in five years, we have grown to um, uh, a global scale uh, in all continents, from Australia to Nigeria to Chile, Argentina, uh, North America, UK, and everything in between. Uh, we are very proud to be partnering with uh, large names in the industry, uh, that endorse uh, what we do, but also allow our solution to be deployed uh, anywhere the need of more data to uh, approve more customers. And uh, with this, I'll leave it to John to introduce Strand. Okay, thanks, Michele, for uh, your collaboration and also Fionn for, for the introduction, everyone here that has joined the webinar. Uh, regarding Strand, just a <clears throat> quick introduction. Uh, we were funded in 2004 uh, 
uh, our main uh, focus there was on the music industry. Okay, we were funded in Oregon and Barcelona by uh, artificial intelligence experts. That what we did at the beginning was a recommendation algorithm for uh, music, kind of Spotify-like, let's say. But then we quickly shifted into the financial industry by creating the first implementation of a PFM, a personal finance management in Europe in 2008. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry, until uh, 2011, where Apple acquired our trans music recommendation algorithm, we still uh, <clears throat> were handling both businesses, but there, uh, once the Apple acquisition, it uh, allowed us to focus more on the financial industry, implementing in 2012 the largest PFM deployment with 10 million retail banking customers. And then until getting 2017, and now that we have more than 700 uh, bank implementations worldwide. Okay, and finally, uh, <clears throat> last year we were acquired by Triff, which is a great scoring uh, business in, in Italy uh, that provides us a, a huge uh, upgrade on our all digital offer. Okay, and as I was saying, as, uh, our um, presence is worldwide. We have more than 700 bank implementations, which means that we are able to serve 100 million customers. Okay, and as Credo Lab 2, we have clients all around the world uh, from Huntington and BBNDA in America, then Santander, BBVA, BBVA HSBC in Europe, Erste Bank, uh, CBA in Africa. Uh, OCBC in Asia, and um, I could go on into <laughs> talking all the 700 clients, but I think it's best that we focus on, on today's uh, main objective that is uh, presenting our use case. So, uh, yeah, basically, I'm going to pass also again to Michele. Uh, thanks, Juan. The idea now is to show you exactly what uh, a user journey will look like if a Credolab solution is embedded into the Strands uh, PFM. So <clears throat> I will share my screen. If, um, Kaison, can you make me the host? Um, the, I will share my screen to show you how the uh, app, uh, a user journey, a typical user journey works for uh, a client of uh, Credolab. In this Acme Bank as being your own uh, app with uh, customers uh, going into the app to apply for a loan. So um, uh, you will see that as soon as I touch the app, we uh, there is a gray notification box. If I swipe, there is also a gray notification box. Uh, this is for demo purposes, but it shows you one of the two sets of data that we access. So um, every interaction with the UI of the app, even the website, is being captured. If I uh, choose a loan amount or a loan term, if I accept a privacy policy, I collect the data. Uh, if I type uh, or delete, delete my name, I also collect the data. So um, this is, as I mentioned, two sources of data that we collect. I will go relatively fast through the process to show you how seamless it is for us to uh, collect the behavioral data. Uh, the, <clears throat> uh, it's a seamless integration. Of course, the user will not see the gray notification box. Um, I'll go relatively fast now. Even if there is a uh, drop-down menu, we still collect the data. So the idea is that we have we are mapping now the behavior of the user we are mapping now the way customers interact with the app and the application form how fast they type how uh, much time they spend on a uh, writing an answer that they should know by heart uh, which could be also a correlation with risk or uh, perhaps with fraud uh, if i uh, want to do the EKYC, I need to allow the app to access this information. And I can say, um, I can choose, I can say this time only, then I can uh, take the, it's me right now. And, um, um, and then I can go on to uploading 
a document. I also have to allow the app to uh, access this permission. And, um, uh, and so uh, I can do the KYC as well. While we do this, as Credolab, we are collecting data. We are collecting metadata of the user. So the user is free to should allow or deny access to this data. Uh, of course, we mirror the permissions that the app already requires so that we do not add any friction to the process. Now, uh, we get to the part where the customer is ready to submit the application form. It could be for a personal loan, it could be for a credit card, a buy now, pay later, could be for uh, working capital if the, um, the user is a small business. And um, uh, I can choose as a user to enable or not additional permissions within the app. Um, I can say no. I don't want to enable any more permissions and I just go ahead straight into submitting the uh, actual application form. At this point, uh, we stop collecting behavioral data related to the in-app interactions and we collect a second type of data, also behavioral, but the digital footprint. So in less than a couple of seconds, the technology embedded into the PFM has collected uh, two sets of data and has shared a score, risk score and fraud flags with the PFM uh, into the strands backend system. At this point, I leave it to Joan to continue and show you a, uh, an actual use case, what you can do uh, when you have collected this type of data. Over to you. Thanks, Michele. Uh, so, yeah, let me share my screen again. Okay, so now back to the use case. Let's say what we want to present you is uh, our integration between uh, Credo Lab and, and Strands. And the idea is that you've seen on Credo Lab side the end user of the bank, okay, signing in on the application and Credo Lab getting data from the bank and the end user. So the idea here, what you're seeing now, is our back office tool on the Strands. And I'm going to go into more detail on, on the use case, but before, let's say, which is the, the goal of this use case, okay? So this is uh, an example that, as Michele was saying, I think is, is quite powerful. So our, our hypothesis here is that the bank wants to sell loans, okay? So this is the starting point on the bank side. And thanks to our collaboration, we have a lot of information on how we could target the, the current um, base customers uh, in order to sell these loans. So the idea here is that you can see the back office uh, mission control that is a platform that we provide to the banks where you can see all sorts of information and you can uh, not only see data visualization. But if we uh, um, stick onto the use case, let's say here what you can see is a dashboard with a lot of information from our, from our end users. Okay, and this in this particular use case, let's say our goal, remember, is to sell loans. So if we start thinking to which kind of users on our database we can sell loans, probably we could say, okay, so it's best that we try to sell loans to people that do not have yet loans. So we see here that there's a 47% of our customer base that doesn't have yet loans. Okay, we can see other types of information like loan duration, uh, size of the loan, etc. But I want to focus also, for example, on the loan, loan propensity. Okay, and as Fion was saying at the beginning, what we try to do is also apply um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms into our database. So in this case, we have a proprietary uh, loan propensity model that allows us to detect which is the propensity of our customers to ask for a loan. Okay. And this is, is the output of this uh, machine learning model. And another one important in this, in this use case is the liquidity alert. Why do I say that? Because the idea here is not only that we are able to see or segment our uh, audience, our uh, database, but also what we try to do with this use case 
is try to see when is the perfect time to offer a loan to the end user. Okay, so the idea is that obviously we can segment the persons, but we want real time recommendations. So the idea here is that our hypothesis that we want to demonstrate is say it's we want to sell loans. So probably we are going to target people that do not have loans. And probably, obviously, it would make sense that we target people with a high loan propensity. And it makes sense that we target these people whenever they have liquidity problems, okay, before they get to have these liquidity problems, because there is the this is the point on the customer journey of the of the users that we already know uh, that is where they are more proactive or keen into uh, getting a loan so the idea here is that uh, through our back office we can uh, customize and see everything on our database these are three um, characteristics that we've shown from the from strands point of view let's say from our um, database and machine learning models but what we can do also is thanks to the integration with credo lab is that we can uh, add their information into our back office so we still even improve the powerful data analysis that we're doing by embedding the credo lab information so here we are able to see the credo lab great scoring that we have been able to do into end users, into the end users, remember, because they were logged in into the platform, as Michele has shown, and they allowed us the permission to make the credit scoring. So here now we have the credit scoring from the Crow Lab and the amount of loans per user. What we could do is what, that we could try to mix both graphics in order to see, okay, which is the credit scoring in all of those segments. So we can see the credit scoring for people that have no loans, that have one loan, and so on. So what we want to mix here too is, as we were saying, the loan propensity. So what happens if we mix it? We end up with a graphic, okay, with five verticals. It's one of zero loans, one loans, and so on. So on the left side, we can see the propensity, the loan propensity that all this segmentation has. And on the right side, we can see the credit score. So if we try to zoom in, for example, we're able to see that people that don't have loans and probably that have a loan propensity over 0 0.7 and a credit scoring over 600 represents 15,000 people on our customer base. So right now we are on, on, on the step, let's say, that we have already to define an audience, a targeted audience, with our hypothesis that they don't have loans, high credit scoring, and so on. So, so the idea is that we know that we have 15,000 people that we could potentially target. Once we know this audience, what we're going to do is try to target them. Okay, so for that, we're going to move into the engager, okay, into the insights. And this is the part of the platform that allows us to create notifications and engagement with the end user. We have here other kinds of use cases that we have already been, been applying, but the idea today <clears throat> is that we wanna show you how to create an insight, a notification from a scratch using data from Credo Lab and Strand with the goal to sell alone. So what we're gonna do is that we're gonna try to add a new insight. We have some <clears throat> templates already here that we would be able to choose if the use case was adapted to those templates, but now we wanna create a new insight. Okay, so basically here you can see a, a really easy to use um, UX experience with uh, four steps and basically, obviously, so let's put a title on the inside and a small description, but the powerful or the first powerful thing on this engager or creation of insights is the conditions. Okay, here the idea is that we were on the dashboard site visualizing all our database. We had our hypothesis, we detected that there were some people that could be potentially targeted from our use case. And here, what we're going to do is that we are going to program or set these conditions in order for this insight to be notified to those people. So basically, we are going to add the conditions that we've already seen, the loan propensity, the number of, of current loans, and the credit scoring provided by Credo Lab in, in our integration.
So we have these three conditions. As you see, it's quite intuitive, let's say. Uh, and yeah, basically, we set up the exact uh, threshold. So we want a long propensity of over uh, 0 0.7. We want a great uh, scoring that is over uh, 600. And we want people that do not have actual loans. Okay, so this is our, the condition set on the inside. And now we can try to refresh and see how many users we're going to be able to tackle uh, with this condition. Okay, so again, it's the 15,000 uh, users that we set at the beginning. Once we have the conditions, what we want to do? We want to go into the real time part of it. Okay, so once we have the customer base, what we want to do is to try to target and contact them in real time when they need it. Okay, because we think that it's not useful to bombard users with thousands of notifications every time they do uh, something. Okay, we, we want to target them in, in real time whenever they need it. Okay, you, for, for sure, you all are familiar with getting 40 notifications in every application that you have on your, your mobile phone and you don't even read those. So the idea is that what we want to get here is that when you really have the need, we talk with you. Okay, nothing else. We don't want to spam you. So the idea is that we have this trigger section that allows us to select the specific uh, thresholds and moments when you would really need this loan. So the idea here is that we were saying the liquidity alert. Okay, we think that uh, someone is going to be more keen to get a loan when we say to them, hey, probably you're going to have liquidity problems, for example, in three days. Why don't you take now a loan and try to avoid these liquidity problems? So with uh, our creation of insights, we are able to, to customize this and target the people in real time. Now, we have conditions and triggers. And the idea is that we're going to see now what we want to say to this customer. Okay, So how are we going to sell the insight? How are we going to communicate with them? So that's why we go into the action section. So once we have the piece of information that we know, we have to act. In this case, we're going to go and see the different actions that we provide to the end user, to the bank user. OK, sorry. And the idea here is that we provide the bank to be able to send notifications to the end customer, but we also provide them with uh, the information to send it to the CRM. So for example, probably if we want to sell this loan, but not send a notification to the end user, we can send this notification to the CRM and a, 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 a call center could call uh, the user. We can send a notification uh, to the database, so we analyze it and so on. So via text message, email. But today we're going to focus on sending noti the notification via web app. Okay, so when we decide which channel we're going to use, we are uh, providing here different kinds of uh, options to customize it. So we can send this in real time or on batch and also which kind of notification. So in this case, we are able to sell it, uh, to send it in app or also as a push notification. And then the copy. OK, so in this part is what uh, every, gang, every bank is able to customize. Which kind of language do you use to communicate with your end users? So in this case, basically, what's saying, hey, what about taking a loan? Uh, hey, username. So here we're able to add variables in order to customize this message to each end customer. So it looks like in three days, you might have liquidity, pro liquidity problems. Why don't you take a loan amount loan? OK, so here you have a lot of, another powerful variable that is able to know with the liquidity problem that you have, is able to, to see how high it's going to be this liquidity problem. So we are able to offer the specific loan amount that you need, nothing else, nothing more. And also the, um, mix with Credo Lab um, um, credit scoring. So you're going to see it in the next steps. Once we have the message um, set up, we're going to offer also or decide which are the call to actions to the end user, which are the options that we're not going to provide. We have some of those, but here on this use case, obviously, we're going to try to sell this, this loan to the end user. So we're going to have uh, to take the act to the call to action to take a loan. Okay. And we're going to add it. 
we are able to here to customize the label that the end user is going to see. And obviously, what we always try to do is to offer more than one option to the end client, okay? Because we, we want them to be able to choose what they want to do. So uh, a second, let's say, secondary um, call to action could be get more details into the load. So probably there, there's gonna be some users that are not decided if they are able to take a loan, so we're gonna give more information to them. But basically our main focus is to sell the loan and make it quick, okay, as you're gonna see now. So with this step, we already have been able to create a new insight, okay, just adding the conditions, selecting at which time we want to communicate with the customer and selecting how we wanna communicate with the customer. So now what we have to do is to save this insight and you're gonna see here that the insight is already created. You see all those case KPIs here that um, are able to show us how the different insights are performing. And what we see here is that once we've created this uh, loan targeting offer, let's say it has already been triggered one time. So let's see how this could look like from the end user perspective. So yeah, basically when our engine on the engager detects that in three days, this user is gonna have liquidity problems, we send the notification, okay? Using the in-app in push notification. So as you can see here is the message, hey Maria, so the message is customized, looks like in three days you might have liquidity problems, why don't you take a 2000 euro loan? Okay, so Maria is gonna say, okay, let's see uh, what this, this is about. We're going to uh, offer the uh, same notification inside the PFM. So Maria is inside our PFM right now. And she's going to click on ask for a loan. And just as quickly as that, we're going to offer the proposed amount that we think, but obviously also giving her other options. But probably she's already OK with this loan amount and repaying it in 12 months. So she's going to ask for the loan. Just a bit more information on the loan and she's going to click confirm and as you've seen the powerful thing here is that with credo lab we are able to pre-score people and they have allowed us this uh, permission so we don't have either the press score here to do any kyc anything okay we can uh, predefine the loan and assign it to these people so here you see how it looks like on maria's phone before the loan was granted okay so it's orange so it's not that good because we know she's gonna have liquidity problems but once the loan is um the loan application succeeds she's gonna get the money instantly okay so now maria is a much better position thanks to uh credo lab and engager and here it ends the 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 end user let's say flow but another thing that we provide into the into the back office, into the engager, into strands, is that we are able to see how this insight is working. Okay, how is it working in real time with all the users, which are interact interactions. So if we go into the details, for example, here we can see how many times the insight has been triggered, how many times the insight has been built. Okay, because as we said, remember you get thousands of notifications every day, so probably. We trigger it to you, but we, you haven't built. Okay, we can see the click through rate too and some feedback. And the idea here is that we give you uh, to the bank user a really simple way to know how your insights and how your communication and how your engagement is working with your end customers. And this is really, really powerful because with this, you're able to retrofit change things imagine that the the insight we see that is triggered a lot but no one views it so probably we could change the message we could change the time on the that we send notification so probably we could say okay send this notification every day at 8 30 in the morning so people is with their phone and so on so on you can still go fine tune all these uh customizable parts in your insights so at the end you get uh let's say the perfect engagement uh, with your customers and yeah, here ends the use case. So let me stop sharing and go back to the presentation because the idea now is that we're gonna try to present you a bit more uh, after the use case, what 
sorry, my computer is a bit slow. Okay, here. So what what Creo Lab can do, and you're gonna see it. Okay, so Michele, back to you. Yeah, and thanks a lot for uh, for sharing that demo. It's really uh, powerful. You now we together we can enable uh, real time notifications that are based on the analysis of a lot of data. You no, know, based on the transactional data, affordability checks, as well as the alternative credit scoring by Credolab, and we have done that without accessing any personal data without receiving any uh, financial information from the bank, uh, without receiving any uh, transactional information from strands. So we, be, we act as an input uh, into the overall uh, machine learning models so that uh, banks can increase product cross-holding uh, ratios of their customers while also, they, while also providing something that is meaningful. Uh, in real time, contextual, and when they need it. So um, I'll, uh, I'll walk you through now a couple of uh, um, slides that explain in more details uh, the way we work, the way we calculate our alternative credit score, and, um, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll uh, hand over to Johannes uh, again to explain more how the Engager works. So um, as I said earlier, uh, we don't process personal data. And that's where the GDPR is a concern or in countries such as Indonesia or Vietnam, where data residency is also a concern, uh, we enable this real-time scoring uh, without compromising the personal data of the user. As you saw during the, uh, during the demo, uh, the user is really free to deny or uh, allow access to our phone data. So if we move on to the next slide, the idea is that uh, embedded into the strengths PFN and therefore into the bank's app, uh, we mirror the existing permissions and we collect the data that the app already has the permission to, uh, to access, but we put that data to work. Basically, uh, imagine WhatsApp, as you saw earlier with the EKYC functionality. I granted access to storage because I needed to uh, upload my national ID. So we, we mirror that permission and we access metadata behind. Uh, we also access, and that's uh, something that we call digital footprint. <clears throat> On top of that, we access also more data related to the uh, typing biometrics. Uh, that means that we collect information on the way people type, how fast they type, um, whether they um, are um, whether their their typing cadence is consistent with confirmed fraudulent users or not. So we can also analyze and detect fraudulent behaviors. And uh, a third set of data that we collect through the app without any friction added to the user experience is in-app gestures. So every time the user taps or swipes or uh, pinches the screen, we collect data. Um, some uh, examples of applications of that, if, you, if the user is uh, applying for the loan and at some point is uh, getting mad or rages into the application form and starts tapping a lot into one particular field, then we know that there is friction there. Then we know that there is a point of the application form that pushes people over the edge. And that could be the income. You know? So uh, we detect that and we help uh, banks improve the application form uh, to remove that friction. But also, we, uh, if we see that uh, income has been typed five times, for instance, that is also a flag that we raise to the bank so that they can manually verify if the income was actually right or not. And uh, uh, if we move to the slide, 
uh, all of this data is fed into our machine learning uh, engine, where we have engineered 10 million signals over the metadata that we have collected. So imagine um, 10 million micro behavioral patterns that are analyzed for, uh, to prevent risk and, um, uh, and fraud. So some, uh, some of these signals are uh, intuitive, such as there are payday loan applications installed, or maybe percentage of selfies taken out of total uh, photos, or um, a device model. Uh, some are related to typing speed, or um, vertical scroll, or um, hesitation to submit, or uh, rage, as I said earlier. So what we do is basically we feed all of this information into a data modeling pipeline that finds correlations between the uh, particular microbehavioral pattern and the probability of a customer to default, or the probability of a customer to uh, miss a payment, or to be fraudulent. So uh, this data is then fed into the either strengths backend or uh, straight into the, the bank's uh, backend system. Uh, that uh, really depends on the integration, uh, but can be also utilized to, um, to produce different types of scores. So if we go to the next uh, slide, uh, we spoke about credit scores, and this is what, uh, what we uh, have seen in the demo. Uh, but we have also other, uh, other uh, fragments of information or other scores that we can develop on the same type of data. So basically, is one integration allows multiple, um, multiple insights. Could be intent uh, about propensity to buy, uh, could be friction, to reduce the, to make the application form or the overall user experience uh, a lot better, a lot more uh, delightful. Uh, could be fraud, you know, could be the analysis of the digital footprint uh, that uh, reveals a suspicious behavior. So we are not talking about AML, we're not talking about PEP or uh, cyber attacks. We are really talking about the analysis of the digital footprint to identify similarities with uh, confirmed fraudulent devices. Um, other additional uh, information could be uh, propensity to file a claim, uh, but that is more for insurances, um, retain best customers, uh, predict churn. So these are additional use cases uh, that are quite uh, complementary uh, with the engagement. And uh, uh, we go on to the last uh, slide, and these are uh, what you can expect. Uh, from a risk point of view, uh, what banks are usually concerned of is about uh, risk and fraud, is about um, approval rate. So imagine the in countries where uh, you don't have a, a strong credit bureau penetration, or uh, you have data asymmetry, or uh, perhaps uh, you have uh, a, a young population where uh, these customers are typically thin files. They have not had enough time to uh, build their own credit history. So they probably bank with you. They probably have the salary uh, credited into your bank account, but they have never taken credit. So if you were to uh, issue a credit card to them, it could be risky simply because we, you don't know uh, how they might behave. So that's where we can help. Uh, faster time to yes, uh, in real time, as shown also in the engager, um, you can approve more customers with uh, keeping risk under control. And uh, with that, I'll uh, hand over to John. Thanks, Michele. So <clears throat> into the strands, just to uh see a bit more after the use case on what do we do. Basically, what we try to do is to be a one-stop shop platform for financial institutions, okay? So the idea is that we're able to provide banks with the personal finance management and the business finance management for those of 
who of you who don't know this is like the banking app that that you have in your phone but then also we have the engager okay okay so this is like the best product because i'm the product owner of it so this one is the the focus today and basically engager have you seen it's an insight driven engagement platform the idea is that with the engager you are able to communicate better to communicate in real time and to satisfy the needs of your end users and obviously too don't forget about that to satisfy the bank users okay because let's say banks want to improve their communication with their users to sell and increase revenue but also to be more engaged with them <clears throat> so this is the the suite of three products that we have but apart from that we have uh, some tech enablers that help us even uh, improve this experience much more. So we provide widgeting and SDKs on the front end part of the integration with um, DPFM and BFM. We have third party connectivities with Credo Lab or with account aggregation, invoice aggregation. We have the advanced analytics that you, as you've seen in the, in the back office tool that we have different machine learning models. So this is one of the other tech uh, enablers. We have the developer portal also in order to improve or facilitate the implementation of our products. And have you seen, as you've seen too, the back office console. Okay, because we think that is really, really important to, to get the information to the bank and allow them to know what's going on inside uh, the strange products on their site. So basically, this is our, uh, what we call one-stop shop platform. If we focus on the, on the engager, I'm not gonna explain details on the architecture or how it, it works from the inside, but I want to keep talking about use cases, okay? Because I think it's the most uh, important thing here. And the idea, again, you've seen the liquidity risk before, okay? But uh, I think this one is really, really, really important because it's the first one or like, at least from my side is what I would love that my bank tells to me, okay, like before I'm going into liquidity problems, they have to tell me that I'm going to have this problem. So these are like a simple, simple use case, but again, really powerful in the machine learning part. And it provides, it detects a need on the end user, okay? So we are able to advance this need and solve different options. Here, for example, we are um, offering a credit line or that they can transfer money from other accounts. Okay, so this is a, a simple use case in the retail sector. But as we said, we also offer the BFM, okay, the business uh, option on that. So the idea is that the engager also can work with it. And what we try to do on the SMEs is, is like also trying to fix or, or see which is the main pain point of this, of an SME. And probably is, is, is again, the same as retail uh, customers liquidity problems and more specifically provide a better cash flow for these SMEs. So the idea is thanks with our third party aggregations, the, the invoicing that I've talked just a few seconds ago, we are able to uh, aggregate the invoices so we know when they have to pay uh, to the suppliers or when they are going to have uh, to be paid from the, uh, their um, buyers. So the idea is that we can combine this information and offer factoring offers, for example, to these SMEs to secure a better cash flow. And the third use case that I want to uh, get here is the private use case, okay, on the private banking, because the engager, if you've seen, is really customizable. And let's say, we don't care which kind of user you have. We provide all the information, all the tools for you to know these customers. So you can target retail ones, SMEs, and private ones. In this case, imagine that we have, we are seeing uh, people on our customer base that is saving 500 euros per month, and they have a mortgage also. So an example that we could provide them uh, as an offer is offer them a discount on their mortgage if they uh, open a new investment account. Okay, so the idea is that, as you've seen, we can customize the use cases for all the needs that the banks and the end users have with the engager. And on my side, uh, basically, yeah, to finalize, 
and sum up and uh, this is the slide that uh, you will have to go to bed in, in bed uh, today okay so that you have to to record it basically the engager and with credo lab collaboration what the banks have and get is that they are going to be able to boost the sales conversion rate the customer satisfaction we also are able to provide and an evolve the digital offering and the, the really powerful thing is that you are able to interact with your customers in the right moment. Okay, so this is like really, really important because I, I'm, I say it three times uh, today, but you are, you are all really familiar with, with your phone, with getting thousands of notifications. We don't want that. We want to be there when the end customer needs it. Okay, so uh, yeah. Please just take a moment to read and save this slide for when the webinar ends. But yeah, basically, this is uh, where the, the main goal that we wanted to demonstrate today. And I'm going to pass the word to Fion to get into the Q&A section if someone has uh, questions. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Thank you, Michele. Thanks for your interesting presentations and also the use case. As a bank customers, I'm also afraid of receiving lots of unrelated promotion from my banks. So I think the use case and also the algorithm that you show can really give a better user experience as a bank users. Yes, yeah, so uh, for all the audience, if you have any questions, you can write down your questions in the Q&A chat box, which is on the right bottom corner on your screen. Yeah, in the meanwhile, I also received some of the audience sent the questions to me privately. Yeah, so uh, first of all, it's about, uh, about the scoring that uh, Michele, you share. Yeah, I got one question is about what is the difference in predictiveness between digital footprint data and in-app interactions or keynote pattern data. Can you please share with us the difference of in predictiveness in these two set of data? Yeah, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, these are two different types of behavioral data. Uh, both of them, they fall under the bucket of alternative data. And uh, as you may know, alternative data is anything uh, besides credit bureau data. Uh, so uh, when, uh, when we started uh, Credolab in 2016, we focused exclusively on analyzing digital footprints. Uh, we have had uh, different uh, use cases. As I mentioned, we work now with uh, uh, nine industry verticals. And uh, uh, what uh, clients can expect, what banks can expect is a score that has very little correlation with credit bureau scores whenever available and also with social demographic information and also with transactional data so we usually measure the predictive of uh, predictiveness of our models in uh, terms of gini coefficient uh, basically gini coefficient is a is a score that goes from zero to one uh, zero is the same as flipping a coin you have 50 50 chances of being right in your decision uh, one is when you are always right and um, uh, our models uh, that the um, most predictive one had a gini coefficient of 52 uh, 0.52 so uh, with a correlation of uh, less than 10 percent so um, the uplift on the general model usually depends on the data that the bank is already processing and the quality of the existing models. So on the web behavioral data, that's the newest source of data that we have added to the, uh, to the mobile SDK. We've added it only a few months ago, but we have had already some interesting uh, stories with uh, scorecards in the range of 0 0.35 to 0 0.42. And the two are also uh, low, lowly correlated between each other. So um, uh, an interesting uh, set of data and scores to play with. Okay, thank you, Michaela. Yeah, I think uh, the alternative data set is also very interesting to all the audience. Yeah, and that's why I also have another questions regarding also the score. Yeah, uh, the question is that 
how can your data be used to assess affordability? Okay, so our data cannot be used to assess affordability. And this is for a simple reason that we do not use any transactional data. So we don't access open banking API or uh, bank account statement kind of data. And this is why it makes this collaboration with Strands even more exciting because Strands already has access to transactional data, transactional behaviors, and um, uh, we complement uh, this set of data. So the affordability can still be done through CRIF or uh, other credit bureaus, can still be done through accessing open banking data. And uh, we bring a different dimension, which in, uh, uh, in data modeling terms is uh, orthogonal to the transactional data. Uh, and that's why it uplifts the predictive power of, of a model. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, this is also very interesting topics that because I also got another audience from, uh, there is a questions regarding this new set of data. The question is that I would like to ask about, are there any ethical issues in collecting digital footprint data? Yeah, also ethical to material. Issues. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ethical issues, uh, the, um, I would say no, uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, we access only privacy consented data. So the customer, as you saw in the demo, uh, the data is collected with the customer grants uh, permission uh, to the privacy consent. Uh, without, from a GDPR point of view, we act as a data, con um, a, a data processor uh, we are not a data controller because we don't process personal data. So the data controller is the bank. We are a processor of the data being controlled by the bank. Uh, a second layer of protection is that we don't process personal data. So uh, the user can calm that their personal information will not be exposed. A third layer of protection is that we access data only if the user grants us permission to access that data. So if the user doesn't want to allow through the operating system, uh, the access of that data, uh, the um, SDK technically cannot access the data. On top of this, I mean, we, we go through due diligence assessments with all the banks that we work with. And um, the, um, uh, we have 18 banks, uh, clients of Credo up today, uh, also challenger banks and neo banks, but these are, these are, have all gone through the ethical assessment of the data. Yeah. Okay. Good to know that because you also have your existing bank customers leveraging your data, which means that they have already go through the whole data privacy process. I think. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this is an good. other questions. Okay, so we have also a question from the audience is regarding some technical questions. Yeah, I think this uh, technical questions can be also to both Makile and also Juan. Uh, first question is, how is the implementation process and how long does it take? Yeah, I think for the engager one and also about the implementation process for Credit Lab and Strengths. Sure. So on the engager and basically the whole uh, suite of, of products that we have, that depends obviously also in, in banks customizations, but our average is from four to six months implementations. And we offer this also depends on if we integrate on premises or on SaaS, so we offer both models. And yeah, basically the limitation there is which is the customization or number of, of fine tuning that we wanna do on the bank. But like if we go there and implement our software, it takes from four average of four months there. Okay, how about Makila? Uh, is it a SaaS or on-premises offering for Credit Lab solutions? Uh, we offer a uh, SaaS solution, cloud-based. Uh, we so most of our deployments, I would say, ninety-five percent of all deployments are uh, on cloud. 
there's a, a minor uh, set of clients that uh, use a proxy implementation. That means that the data that we collect goes first to the bank and then on to us. So this is, um, and the reason, the only reason is that the bank wants to have slightly more control over the data uh, that they uh, share with, uh, with Tredolab. Um, in general, the SDK, so uh, working together with strengths, the SDK is uh, embedded into the strengths PFM. So in the four to six months implementation time that John described, there will be also the Credo Lab capability. Uh, if the, the bank wants to have a standalone implementation, it may take between two to five days. It's actually very straightforward, uh, very easy to integrate. Okay, great. Yeah, I think uh, we can also answer one more question from the audience. Yeah, so uh, I have, okay, I have a question also from Akira, is how can we be sure that you collect our metadata, but not personal data? I think uh, a lot of the audience will have concern, maybe because they are from the banks. Yeah, they want to understand better about the data privacy issues. Yeah, so I leave the last questions to you, Makile. Yeah. And this is also a quite common question we receive, especially from banks. Uh, there, there are different uh, um, assessments that we go through. There is an info security assessment, uh, data governance and data ethics assessment, uh, compliance. Uh, on the verification itself, uh, if the SDK accesses the data we claim we access, we have our own audit, independent audit conducted by a third party vendor. Uh, but uh, we have also, uh, the bank is free to choose uh, to audit our SDK at their own expenses. And this is something that we have done most recently in Cambodia, where the bank wanted to know exactly what data we accessed and if we did access only uh, metadata, not personal data. So, it's um uh we can also the uh, the quickest way actually is to test the sdk and we will share the actual json file so we can share the actual uh, data being generated by uh, by the, our sdk uh, for the bank to control Okay, thanks for that. Thanks for the explanations. Yeah, I think uh, this is the end of our webinar because we have a very great time control today. Yeah, so once again, thanks for all our speakers and also, of course, thanks for all the attendance for the webinar. Yeah, on strength side, we will keep continue to, uh, to have different types of webinars with different partners or different experts from our team. Yeah, so see you all in the near future. Take care and stay safe. Bye-bye.